group if anyone is available online. Yeah. Is Jessica available online? No. Okay. Then I will I will take the opportunity and provide the update on her behalf and uh, on Randy's behalf. Uh, from perspective of accomplishment, uh, the nursing committee has been working very hard on providing few uh, some work and has achieved that work during the year. Uh, to list few, we have the collaboration with the nursing knowledge big data science encoding and modeling work group. Uh, the nursing committee collaborated with the long staff on defining reusability of answer codes. Uh, they provided hands, ANI, and NKBDS for the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science report out and shared with us. Uh, the National Council of State Board of Nursing, uh, they submitted the unique nurse uh, identifier. Uh, Champs, Humpty Dumpty, and Schmidt fall risk assessment scale submitted. And they defined the new charter, scope, and purpose, as well as membership. This is from perspective of accomplishment. Uh, the work that's underway right now is continued collaboration with the nursing knowledge, big data science encoding and modeling work group, educate members and participants on long heuristics procedure and new long initiatives, discuss the usability of clinical care classification known as CCC codes, identify gaps in social determinants of health, long codes, continued participation in long SNOMED collaboration, support long team in nursing related requests and neonatal infant pain scale NIPS revision and update of data elements. So this is a work underway. It takes different speeds, but it is definitely uh, going on. The objective uh, for the six months coming is recruiting and support more nurse informaticists and define plan on how to proceed with the clinical care classification updates. Uh, the other updates that we're going to be providing for each committee is the work calendar through the next year. Um, for whoever is interested in um, be a part of the nursing committee calendar, please uh, Let's, uh, you know, we'll be able to talk about membership at a later time and they will be able to help us with that. But for now, the meetings are every first Monday of each month. And the exceptions are uh, January, July, and September. Uh, October meeting is replaced by the long conference. So we have in, to in total eight meetings in total per year. Next will be an update on our radiology committee. And it's had the, uh, the committee chair is Dr. Ken Wang from Baltimore VA Medical Center, University of Maryland. The accomplishment that happened, I just want to double check that Dr. Ken is not on, is not okay, thank you. Uh, from an accomplishment perspective, uh, what uh, the committee has uh, done through the last year is uh, new radiology specific LP parts were created. Uh, we had a few guest speakers on uh, on the committee itself, and it was nice to be able to um, uh, host Dr. Uh, Felice Cross uh, from UCSF, where he presented the project about naming convention project, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, they call it MEDIRC, M-I-D-R-C, which is the Medical Imaging Data and uh, Resource Center project, where RSNA is gathering data across all the radiology, uh, com uh, community in the world uh, to, uh, to do studies about the results for the COVID testing. Um, and uh, the other accomplishment was define a new charter, uh, scope and purpose and membership. Uh, the current initiatives uh, that's happening right now is actually um, series and sequencing examples and approach as part of the naming convention. Uh, the radiology concept model identify as cross-cutting issue. This is something we're going to be discussing at a later time. And it is in collaboration with the clinical committee on how to approach it and how to resolve. So we are looking into that. Uh, review of new proposed information model uh, by the radiology committee identified as a cross-cutting issue as well. And it will be worked on with the clinical committee. 
uh, image-based AI results. Uh, we are start thinking about it because we have few questions about it. And the radiology committee charter, which is in progress currently. The six months objective is uh, looking to finalize the radiology committee charter, uh, adjustment to the information model that's being proposed. Uh, the third project is series and sequencing. Uh, preliminary discussions has been taking place in agreement on the steps going forward and uh, finalizing hopefully the radiology charter. Uh, from perspective of calendar, uh, the radiology committee meets every fourth Tuesday of each month at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, going forward, starting from November, we have two tentative dates that are not the usual dates, but we are looking into um, you know, voting on whether it is feasible to do it or not. And this is for the date of November uh, the 7th and December the 5th. But otherwise, uh, we have regular meetings during the fourth Tuesday of each month, except for October, where the meeting is replaced by the long conference. Next is the laboratory committee update. And I have the pleasure of uh, Pamela uh, to give us these updates. Please, Pam. Can you hear me? All right. If you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, I want to really express gratitude to all those that participate with us on the laboratory committee. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge and there's a ton of enthusiasm to tackle the hard puzzles. Uh, for accomplishments, uh, as you've seen, we uh, were able to incorporate the semi-quantitative scale addition uh, with one exception uh, in blank release 2.76. Um, there was a separation of the component uh, from the component field of the method of RAST, so a reorganization. Uh, and then we've created uh, the, plas the surface plasma resonance method. Uh, there were some corrections on this respiratory specimen. Uh, we had some great discussions with the National Kidney Disease on the new EGFRs. Um, and then we've gained new members. Uh, and guests presented on ECP in Canada and HLA typing. Um, we do have some members uh, from the committee that have changed employers. And so there's a little bit of uh, transition going on to keep their membership on the committee, but we're always welcoming our, all the support that takes place. Uh, and then we we did work with Virginia Real towards defining a new charter, a scope and purpose and the membership process. We're currently working on HLA typing creations uh, following up with the multi-disc method of uh, allergens because um, they had their, their component of RAST was moved from the component field to the method field. And so now what do we do where it already had multi-disc in the method? Um, cell biomarkers, we'd like to look over the mapping guides. They've been updated. They, they haven't been updated since they were released. So we'd like to look that through um, and update semantic heuristics uh, in the user's guide. Lab results in mobile apps is gonna be kind of cutting edge, patient generated health data. Um, and that's gonna be on, discussed a little bit later in the cross cutting uh, session and cleaning up some uh, representation. And some of those in the next six months, I think additionally, we'd like to, uh, let's see, go ahead and advance the slide. Trying to see here, I'm getting out of sequence. Um, so we have a just for those a benefit for those who hadn't seen the the qualifications in order to have a quantitative scale updated on a term to semi quantitative. We have a, a methodology slide of how we did that, and I think um, two other opportunities that we've got that were discovered kind of today, or maybe within the last week involve um, maybe having the lab committee participate with any questions on the LOINC SNOMED collaboration, mm -hmm. especially for those things, those tougher ones, the ratios and the tougher numerics, uh, ratios and fractions. And also we'd like to uh, offer help and expertise for the LOINC development committee, um, possibly getting into a, a workflow stream after their, their meeting with Dr. Bayorto on uh, some of the submissions and, and if there's any questions and they want to speak further, someone in the laboratory to, uh, 
to have that access. Another slide? Yes. I think it's just going to be to the calendar. So we meet the third Thursday of most months, uh, exceptions in January with the, and August with the release, and then July for holiday. Um, so we're, we're cutting down from 12. We were, I was driving them hard. We were meeting every month. <laughs> so we're giving them a break with eight meetings, eight meetings a year now. And if you have any interest in joining the committee, we are um, always open armed and welcome for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next on the agenda is document ontology committee update by uh, Dr. Robert McClure. Please. Go, hey, hi folks. <clears throat> so, next slide, I guess. Um, I think many of you have heard that we've, we've got some interest in, uh, in uh, clarifying what we what we have in the document ontology. And so um, that's a part of this, but starting with the accomplishments, we have worked hard with LOINC and the, the technical team, and, and it's uh, been very beneficial, I think, in that we've been able to uh, and, and if you were here at the on the initial day, it was discussed in more detail, and but improve the browser, be able to provide um, API defined search capabilities that, uh, sorry, search capabilities that not only work in the UI and the, in the browser, but also in, uh, translate into the API, and that also cross into the uh, document ontology and better understand how to take take advantage of that. So. In addition to that, we've also added the ability across that browser. Again, you may or may not have seen this, but you can download the content, the result of the search, somewhat like you can do in the in the quote search um, link space, the browser space. You can also now document uh, download that content. So, really been uh, really been useful. We we had some uh, folks come in and, and speak to us about various aspects of the documents, so guest speakers, and then. Um, and like the other groups and this has been a wonderful addition we've done a better job of of kind of defining who we are how we're gonna how we're gonna operate we're probably not completely done with that but it's now more than just a group of people who meet in a, on a particular day but actually have some uh, some structure around that so that's really wonderful um so again I just mentioned we're, we're very much interested in in working on clarifying the document ontology structure and the components of the documents I think for many of us, sometimes gets a little bit unclear as to, for example, is something a type of surface subject matter domain or whatever, and, and we need to do a better job of making that clear because <clears throat> I, like many people in this process, want to make it more automated in a sense that if someone comes in with requests or when they do, <clears throat> we can kind of do a better job of figuring out what we're trying to create when we make it. So we've um, worked through our uh, Top level attribute definitions, and we've got a, a chunk of those done. We've got more to do, um, and then uh, and then I, we, you know, I kind of talked about the search capabilities, and we're continuing to improve that. Once again, I think you've heard this, and I, the work that we're doing, I think, applies across a lot of point, but it's absolutely important in the documentology in terms of defining these uh, these uh, the attributes, the characteristics of documents. We're starting with that first top level stuff, which is obviously important, but uh, hopefully you all know there is a document ontology. <laughs> and that means that there's a bunch of concepts that are more specific <clears throat> underneath those top level concepts. And honestly, we need to be clear about what those things need too. So we're working on that. And I'll just finish, you know, again, you, you got a sense of this earlier today and that we want that to align with SNOMED. So that'll be a big part of what we're doing, I think, is trying to make sure that as we create these uh, definitional as aspects of documents and that aligns and actually will then be, well, the, the right word is not incorporated, but uh, extended, I guess, into SNOMED that, you know, for example, if you're doing, and again, I don't know how many people really do this in a computable way, but certainly in a logical way, if you're thinking, I want to go see all the cardiology things. You should be able to find the cardiology snowman concept. In fact, you should be able to tell that when someone has a cardiac problem that's recorded in snowman, that will lead you to the cardiac related documents. That's my goal. I think everybody would probably say yay to that. 
So that's what we're going to work on. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, calendar, right. So um, I guess what what we do is we, we target the second Tuesday of each month. That was what we were doing. I'm supposed to not be working on Tuesdays. <laughs> so we're going to change that. <laughs> I want to change that. Um, but but the idea is to actually try and do it on a monthly basis. We usually have, a, as evidenced by what I was just talking about, there's not going to be a, a month when we don't have work. That being said, you know, if we can't meet, we won't meet. And um, and we'll push it to another time. And obviously, October is replayed by the place by here. And as you see, we'll, we'll tend to push forward a week, I think. But a lot of times, it has to do with overlapping something that other people are involved in. I want to strongly encourage folks to participate. I mean, I, I think you all understand each part of Link is actually kind of fun and exciting, and, and, and there's reasons to be involved in that. But um, and the documents are a big chunk of what's actually exchanged these days. Uh, I, I can't remember what the number that gets touted. Uh, Dan, you probably know, but it's like in the hundreds of millions, like literally. <clears throat> So, you know, outside of the, the V2, it is the most commonly used health exchange artifact, I think. And, and we need to really, I think, improve our ability to find exactly what we want and help people properly encode these things. So that's what we're going to do. Thank you so much, Rob, for the updates. And now we'll get uh, to the clinical committee update by uh, Stan and uh, Ted. Next slide. Sure. So, <clears throat> accomplishments. Uh, we're going to talk about it more, but we have uh, a resolution for the temporary link codes. So that's that's a poor name, but <laughs> what it is is how do we get link codes early that we can use, assuming everything is right. Uh, you know, within within a, a week or two, while you know the the official review and and, and becoming valid long term codes, you know, may take six months or or so. Is that we we have a solution for that that we worked out, and we're going to review that more in the cross cutting issues section. Uh, we, I think we were maybe the last one to do our charter, <laughs> so we got that done. So we don't have we don't have a black mark on that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we've been participating in the in the Link Snowman collaboration, uh, which is as you know, exciting part that we talked about this morning. So uh so you know, work underway. We're gonna continue to work on the uh the link ontology uh in the cross-cutting issues area. Uh, the clinical committee is going to uh, collaborate with the radiology and document ontology committees. Uh, so, you know, going back to what Rob said, we really want to integrate the development of the document ontology with the um, the SNOMED work uh, because we want the documents to become part of the the SNOMED extension, and and so that requires a, a good formal and and common understanding of those things. And so we don't we don't want to do that as two separate activities. We just want to do it together. So um, I'll just put it out. If you have an interest in the document ontology work, and we'll say this to the the SNOMED crowd uh, next week. Uh, you know, contact me or contact Rob or Isa, and we'll get you on the. Uh, get you on the committee so that uh, we can participate and work through that together. Um, and then we, the clinical committee, actually the way we define the charter is that any work that doesn't fall into one of the existing committees, so it's not documents, it's not lab, it's not nursing, that that is the focus of the clinical committee as well. So. Uh, but when we do that, then we need to 
understand how we work across committees and how we how we manage cross cutting issues. So uh, we're still working on that. So six month objectives, cross cutting issues, and the the link extension. And we've been bad about holding clinical meetings. So we're going to resume that in 2024, and we'll figure it out. But I, you know, my goal would be that we meet at least once a month, um, and because there's a lot to talk about. And if we were holding meetings, then I think people would bring bring issues up. So that's my report. Thank you. Do you want to uh, add anything, Ted? <laughs> well, we have we have the continuing we have the continuing general cleanup of content. Uh, and there was um, when the clinical content in LOINC, LOINC was first uh, proposed to be added and began to be added into LOINC, um, uh, we, we started out from the laboratory model and uh, we made certain assumptions and we evolved um, the use of the axes and some of the representations as we added content in. Uh, and we keep running into little things that uh, need to be a little bit cleaned up and a little bit brought forward to where we we are in our state of thinking today in the representation. So a continuing reevaluation and cleaning up of some of the content in the clinical area that will that will continue. Thank you so much. Appreciate the update. Thank you so much for your update. Uh, next on the agenda is. Um, April, everybody knows her by now, our senior product manager and head of operations. She is going to be taking you through the process of how to join the committees. Thank you. Um, so as many of these fabulous people up here have stated, uh, we welcome everyone's interest in being a committee member. Uh, this slide right here that you see walks you through all of the steps. I'll just hit the highlights essentially. We have a great website page. If you go to loink.org slash committee, you will see lots of information about our committees. Uh, they also have a contact button. So we have dedicated mailboxes where you can send your interest. If you are interested in any of these committees up here, send us a message that way. Uh, there's some documentation to occur. We'll request a CV. And then we'll invite you to attend some of these meetings so you can get a feel for what's discussed, uh, see that the cadence works for your schedule, and then there will be a formal uh, vote on your inclusion, and then we'll welcome you on to the rest of them. Any questions about committee interest? Definitely go to the page, you'll see lots of information there. That's the last one. Any questions so far? Then, if not, then uh, I will. We're gonna go into our uh, second piece of this uh, the committee update, which is the cross cutting issues, and that's gonna be moderated by our uh, esteemed advisor Virginia Real. Uh, just a couple of minutes until she join me here on the podium. Um. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for um, being here uh, for this part of the agenda. We struggle to find the right place to put all our topics, and if we moved this somewhere else this week, you would have told us something else should have been in this slot. So we put it in the best place that we could. Um, I am Virginia Real, and for the past two years, I've had the honor and pleasure of supporting LOINC in the areas of strategy, governance, and process improvement. And I have been saying this week to a number of you that it is astounding that an organization of this size has the reach and impact that it does in a conference this week has just brought that home to me personally. So you all and uh, all the volunteers, all the staff, you know, are to be commended for just producing miracles <laughs> every day. Um, so I'm going to be moderating this session and the panelists on the stage are going to be providing an overview of each issue um, and then discussing the issues among themselves, which um, because they are cross-cutting issues, it's important to have the other um, 
chairs weigh in, and then we will open the floor for questions and comments from all of you, and we hope we will have those. Um, our panelists today, you know, um, but I'll just quickly say we have Stan Huff and Ted Klein, who are the co-chairs of the clinical committee, Pam Banning, the chair of the clinical of the laboratory committee, and <clears throat> Rob McClure, the chair of the document ontology committee. Um, and then we also have Marjorie Rollins, the executive director, and Isa Hafiza, the director of terminology services and operations to support our discussions. So um, just to give you the context, cross-cutting issues are issues that traverse two or more long committees. And so um, this is a process that we put in place last year as we began to uh, establish the uh, Committee Chairs Council, which does have a charter. <laughs> and um, the Committee Chairs have been convening approximately every three months uh, to talk about both cross-cutting issues and other uh, topics that they wanted to bring to the table and talk with each other about. And it's been immensely useful process. And I, we've appreciated the extra time that they have committed to be able to participate in that committee. Um, and so uh, last year, for those of you who were here last year, we presented a group of cross-cutting issues um, at that meeting, and we really had great discussion with the people who were here at the need meeting. Um, the uh, presentation will follow a brief description of the issue, a summary of the status of the resolution of the issue, and key considerations in resolving the issue, and then we'll have questions. And um, we definitely welcome your input and suggestions. And I think I just, um, <laughs> um, this is our agenda for today. And we have seven cross-cutting issues. And I, let me make sure I can tell you what those are. The first is the assignment of temporary link codes, which will be STAN, updated radiology concept model, which uh, ESA will present. The clarification of document ontology structure and components, which will be Rob, um, and then pre and post coordination, which will be ESA, correct, ESA? Yes. Okay. Uh, patient generated health data collection, PAM, uh, collaboration on change management definitions uh, in LOINC, and is also PAM, and then LOINCs for existing attributes in message structures. And one thing I want to just mention transitioning from last year to this year is that um, we had um, another cross-cutting issue last year, which was the semi-quantitative. And that issue, we went, we went through our process, which was to confer with all the other chairs and say, do any of you wanna participate in this? And everyone said, we don't think that's germane to us. And it went back to the lab committee. And I, I just tell you a story from last year, Pam got up and said, should we address semi-quantitative? I've been told many times, don't go there. And the group in the room said, yes. <laughs> and Pam took on that challenge this year. And I just personally want to say how nice it is to come back to this meeting and say, we talked to you last year. We made progress on this issue. It's very significant progress. And the fact the first issue we're going to hear about the temporary loan codes is another example of that, where this cross-cutting issue process and the conversations with you have enabled us to get through some of the issues. There's more to come, but you know, progress has really been made by the committee chairs in this process. So I think Stan, you are up first. So a summary of the challenge is, uh, you know, the length of time that it takes from the time that you submit a request for a loan code until you actually get an approved loan code and it's released for general use. Um, coming from the perspective, which is where I work most of the time in actually using loan codes and working software, that's an unacceptable time delay. <laughs> so you're, you're faced with a dilemma of either not using a loan code and just making a, one, a, a local code or um, yeah, you just have to do a workaround basically because you can't you can't stop a, a software development project for six months while you wait for a new code. So that's that's the challenge. 
Uh, now, do we have a slide that I think the next slide summarizes what we said we were going to do? Yeah. So, uh, talking with uh, the Regan Street staff and the folks that are actually smart about this kind of thing, uh, this is what we're proposing. Uh, on the link submission form, there will, will be a checkbox option to request an expedited link code, quote unquote. Uh, and checking the box will require the end user to enter supporting information about why they need an expedite, you know, why they need an expedited codes. Uh, and the, the, the HDS team members will then communicate directly with the requester to ensure that uh, they really need the expedited codes. Uh, and then the expedited codes will be created or declined within two weeks of the request. Uh, and will undergo a basic validation. So this basic evalu validation really is to say, is there, you know, um, are the codes that are being requested within the scope of LOINC? Uh, so we, the whole thing will be thwarted if this pre-evaluation becomes the full evaluation, uh, because then it'll take six months again. But I mean, so it'll just be to say, oh, you know, um, the uh, spot patterns on kittens are not part of LINK. Uh, so, you know, so it just really a yes or no, is this, you know, within the scope of LINK? And if it's within the scope of LINK, then uh, they will, you'll get those expedited codes back within, within two weeks. Uh, those codes will just be published back, given back to the requester. They won't be published as part of the, the uh, release or pre-release. They'll only be given to the requester. So, uh, and there's, we'll talk a little more about that. So after that though, the, the request will go through the normal process and the codes will either be assigned or not assigned uh, in the usual way. So if, somebody submits and they get an expedited code, uh, you could find out then in the full review, you could find out, oh, that's actually redundant. This is a synonym that we didn't recognize. That LOINC code already exists and we just need to add another name, uh, you know, another uh, lookup name for that so that people can find it, but it already exists. Or for whatever reason, uh, there isn't sufficient information or whatever. So the codes, the expedited codes could either you know, ultimately be confirmed or they could be rejected. The, the implications of this are that if I submit uh, codes that are ultimately rejected, then it's my responsibility to, uh, as, as a developer, to correct that in my system. So if I get back from, from, from HDS that my code is redundant and I should be using this other code, then it's my job to substitute the correct code for what I for that temporary code that I was using for that expedited code. And not only do I have responsibility for my own software, but if that if that was being communicated in an interface or shared with other business partners, then I've got to correct that as well. So there's, you know, the if you will, the obligation of requesting an expedited code is that if you ask for codes that ultimately are not uh, approved, then it's up to you to fix the mess caused by that. Uh, and so they're only intended to be used in a self-contained implementation and, and it's a use at your own risk until they become part of that of the actual release. Uh, and so then HDS will communicate that, you know, which codes were published and which codes needed to be corrected or uh, deprecated. And then, uh, you know, public criteria and guidelines for expedited codes will be developed and shared with the community and communicated directly to requesters whenever this type of request is made. So um, I'll stop there. I mean, it's not a, it's not perfect, but I don't know, I don't, it's the it's the best way that I could think of to do it, and it worked, uh, you know, for the HDS staff to do it this way. But 
uh, do people have a, a better thought uh, or, or questions or about this process? Sam, if I could just add a comment to what you said. Sure. Um, I think what's different now is one of the reasons why we wanted to do sort of temporary codes was to propose, was to save blank codes and not waste a code. I think we're at a different place now where if that code ends up not being used, it won't be used again, right? So, and I just think that, that um, that's probably uh, an important distinction of where we are now in our, our sort of our thought process. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. So this, um, this sounds a little bit to me like a, a poor man's like extension um, in that uh, a code that's rejected by, well, even a code that's accepted, but a code that's rejected and is still needed by a particular user, uh, they may want to create that code for use within their own organization. Um, <clears throat> so we had talked many years ago uh, at Loink about whether or not extending Loink within a particular organization is, is something that would be feasible. Um, have you rethought that process? Before? Well, I think our assumption was different. My, to, my way of thinking is that if if they request the code and and they need it, we'll create it. So we're not going it, to, it, it's not whether uh, we think it's needed or not needed. It's whether it can be, you know, validly defined as the one code, and if it is, we'll make it, even if there's only one person in the world that needs it. So you would, yeah. Uh, so we wouldn't. The only the only reason for rejecting it is not because we don't think it would be used. That is that that it's not even it's it's not in the scope of blank. In which case, uh, we would argue that you know then it's not an observable. It's not something that appears in data in anybody's data. So. We thought about it, yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I think at least my my assumption was different. My assumption is we're going to make codes that anybody asks for as long as they're they're appropriately defined, and uh, we wouldn't reject codes that people wanted, even if it was only for their own institution. Uh, okay, so I'm going to cross cut. <laughs> um. Thank you. <Matt. laughs> With. Due respect to my esteemed colleague on the other end of the table, um, <laughs> we've it, in the document ontology. So I'm going to use that as kind of the lunch point for my kind of general precision. Um, we've struggled a lot with requests that were, I think, would would you know if if you if you kind of put some like we're trying to do some structure around, you know, okay, is this a valid code or not? And there's a lot of, that's a pretty big space for like, I think um, they would be, they would meet that criteria, but we didn't make those codes because what we were trying to balance was the idea of a standardized representation that didn't, uh, and this is actually too crude of a statement, but I don't have a better nuanced way to say it, that didn't go through a combinatorial explosion. And so, you know, we would say, well, that's a one of these. And we would interact if possible with the requester to kind of say, look, you know, you asked for something that's really specific and kind of unique, but it's kind of like this and is saying this. And, and, and I'm still saying in that context, sometimes it would be, hey, this thing exists, but it would still generally be a new code, but it would be a new code that that isn't as specific as they actually requested. And um, and so I'm pretty confident we've done that in, in the past. I'm totally confident that I, as a person, would encourage us to do that. And I think this gets to, to the point that Jim was making in that if you create a process, and I'm, I'm not saying anything about this that I don't like, I'm just saying that if you create a process where people can kind of request codes that they get to get with a automated kind of analysis and maybe chat GPT will be more strict than just, you know, yes or no. <laughs> um, 
we would uh, we would get people who are then getting codes that then upon more review we'd say you know we'd really rather that either that new code that you created is actually slightly different than what you've actually called it or even possibly that, that it's something else so for example i mean you know we all know this i was i happen to be looking at the the cell list which is something that's um that's used uh, for open mrs and the sort of thing you know they have a very open process by which people put in concepts into their own space and it, you know, the stuff that I saw that was being put in there um, as, uh, for example, as findings were clearly observables, right? Um, well, you know, us, our technical people, you know, they were, of course, they were just putting in whatever they needed. They just, oh, that's a finding. But, um, and so I, I think that's where Jim's going is that if we open, and I want to, if we open up this process for temporary codes, then you know, what I heard when Jim was asking that was, okay, that person, if we say, no, we want something different, then that thing, will it persist, right? Because it's going to be inside their space and they're going to call it a link code because it's a, it's got a link coded thing associated with it. And, um, and it's that persisting part. I think that, you know, again, it's that genie out of the bottle thing. I, I don't think we could even, there, even if we said, no, you can't use it anymore, you know, <laughs> how's that going to work? <laughs> you know, where's the link? Right. So it is going to be out there. So, so I think what we have to kind of think about is how does, I mean, I still think that use at your own risk works. I think if we say, hey, what you requested, it becomes, you know, you asked for uh, ZZX and we make it ZZY, then, um, and that's the, then one, we have to decide, does ZZY get a different identifier? And then two, what do we do with the fact that there may be ZZX and ZZY or, or that there's this person who thinks ZZ, you know, Y is a ZZX in their system? Those are the things that I think we have to have a really firm decision on. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the corner case. So it is not infrequent that I, one code request comes in and uh, after modeling and analysis and checking what else is like and seeing how it maps to the like concept model, uh, possibly with some back and forth with the submitter, um, what finally gets added into like um, has a different meaning. Sometimes it's not a big difference, but it not infrequently has a slightly different meaning. So we have a couple of circumstances and Rob just touched on them uh, at the end there. Um, uh, it's incumbent upon the submitter either to um, uh, go back through his use of it, uh, where he saved the code or used it, transmitted it um, with its meaning as they, it was submitted and see if it's still valid with the meaning that was finally approved and put in the log. Um, they may or may not do that. Um, if they uh, maintain the temporary code and um, and we have a new code, it'd be the same code value. So you'll have two codes that look like one codes um, that they have different meanings if they were done in the beginning or they were done after they were added to look. So that's one issue. The other issue, of course, is if the code is denied, then the assumption and the obligation is that they clean up their use. But we all know how well cleanup activities are followed up. Um, it's as best as you can, which often is, is not as well as you'd like to because you have time, resource, et cetera. And so there'll still be a code floating around out there. Um, so as Stan said, it's not ideal. It really solves one particular very, very narrow pain point that we got a lot of complaints about. It took too long. And this is merely to accelerate the time frame, but not in the end change anything from you never having had the code to use in the first place and either using your own temporary code and figuring out what to do with it, your own homebrew code or not. Um, so can I, so as I sit here and think about this, I mean, I, I very much want 
these temporary codes to, to, to exist. And so, right, that's right. That's exactly right. Again, I'm, I'm channeling Jim out there. I, I think that once we, uh, we create these codes, they exist. So I, I think that this issue is, do we, um, if we've decided that, the, and I would say the exact request is not what's actually put into LOINC. I think the issue that we need to decide is whether that code is a new code or it's the same code. And I think that in doing that, we need to, I still think we, we have an obligation no matter which of those two paths we take, i.e. if we, if we um, keep that old one, but never take it out of the quote temporary space, i.e. <laughs> it's an extension, um, and then put the new one that we say, this is the one that's real that we want you to use and put that into LOINC. That's one solution. The other solution is we keep the original identifier and have as its established meaning what we've chosen and have the original meaning some other kind of thing associated with that code. I see those as being the only two choices, and, I, and I'll just, once again, I'd love to get Jim's response to what I'm saying, but I, I'm thinking that the second choice allows us to not have what he's calling a link extension, whereas the first choice, I think, requires that we have a link extension. Is that, would you agree with that, Jim? I would agree with that, except for the your your second option about putting in Lang's interpretation of the meaning uh, if that differs from the intended meaning of the original request then it, it shouldn't be the same code yeah well and so that would re but that would require a traceability it's a traceability one. thing yeah would, that is a traceability thing because you have a replaced by right it would be, there it would mean that we would have to trace these string representations that quote are the other meaning, but we're we're ignoring that other meaning. So there is no that meaning doesn't exist in Loink. It's just a string that was asked for that happens to be living in some other place. Yeah. Well, my my main concern about you know assigning something as as being allowed within one institution is that it's no longer temporary at that time. It's established. It's going to be used forever. It's not going to get replaced. That's the Loink police part. So well, I know. I know. So. <laughs> So that's a new job description that uh, that uh, April's going to have to figure out how to get hot I need the funding. Stan, did you have a comment? Well, I, I can wait my turn. Okay. Um, just a couple of comments or questions about how this is actually going to play through and the the, pre uh, the prominence of keeping a temp code. If there's if it's determined that an existing code has the same meaning and the temp code needs to go away, is that going to flow into the map to file so that it's there in permanent? It wouldn't be. I think you know, I keep hearing in my left ear <laughs> that's not a temporary code. So okay. this approach is that it's a, it's a code that just exists and and as to point out what you know what what uh, Jim was saying, I think the issue is do we release that code to the general public or not? Well, i.e., it's an extension that lives off separately as as a as a I don't know what you're going to call them primary codes like the extension codes. <laughs> well, and and that brings up a good question, Rob. Is what status is going to be assigned to these? Because now we've got trial active, discouraged, and deprecated. Are these codes going to have their own status so that they can be isolated? So yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're, you're ahead of us. We're not quite there yet. All right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's a good question. I, thank you. <laughs> Do you have additional question there? No, that's okay. okay. Yeah. So a couple things uh, that I think would be helpful to clarify. I don't think we necessarily need to discuss them, but one, just to be clear, whether what code is created will persist through the entire life cycle or be, you know, come out the other end when probably a high priority or a high probability number of cases, you know, as part of the release. But secondly, I think the most important thing is how do local institutions, how should local institutions identify the code system for this code? Is this their code or is this Link's code? And it seems like that ownership might, 
the way it's proposed might change over over time. So that, I, but my main question was, I wonder if you could give some sense for the delta between two weeks and what the average for getting into the pre-release status is now, just so I have some understanding of the, the magnitude of the problem that this approach would solve, because for a while, Loink has published as a, in a pre-release way the things that are uh, past QA queued up for validation or queued up for the next release, but that's a um, that's that's still a there's still some gap between when it's submitted and getting to that state. So I'm just curious what the the average sort of time has has become. Yeah, or average time. It's actually, it's actually Stephen who had to leave today. Um, <laughs> So we don't actually have the uh, what the what the new delta would be, but um, I think uh, the idea is that uh, since we have uh, facilitated and they created the, the code within within two weeks from the request because it is the need, then in order for it to be in a release, it's gonna follow the same order that we have been following as in an order of when it came to address it. So um, I cannot tell right away to the next release, but uh, it is something that we are still in discussion because also we have to uh, keep in mind that if we're going to do it, if it's going to uh, go beyond the next release, it's become something that they are used to. And when you're going to be releasing it, that's going to be, oh, what happened now? No, we are not going to be using the same code that we are using. But uh, we are in, in the process of discussion what it is needed or when it is actually the time frame that we're going to be releasing yeah. that. Yeah. So I think I think also Dan might be asking an additional question. And the question is, is this going to be uh, swifter than what the pre-release, is that the question that you're asking? So whatever the cycle is for the pre-release, uh, releasing the pre-release codes, should this uh, have a happen in advance of that? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, well, I, so it seems like there's a commitment here. So if I make a request today, within two weeks, I'm gonna get either a decision, but most likely a new code created. And if I submitted it without clicking the expedited, then it will go into the usual process and at some point you know it will be if it's accepted it'll go on the pre-release page which is in advance of an actual release so i'm thinking like what's the average time for a request to go from the request to the pre-release the landing on the pre-release page because yes. i'm just trying to understand like the the weight of creating this new mechanism to close that gap between the time when a code appears and when this right. sort of expedited path happens i'm just trying to understand like well how big is that gap if it's like two months is it two months versus two weeks is that we're closing or is it like four months <laughs> or six months i think uh, ideally it would be the next release that, but that's not what he's asking is it is less that, less than six months <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but I, I think so the, the question is someone requests this code it's not the expedited process, correct? Right. So what we're trying to do is shorten our turnaround time overall so that our stats look a lot better and we can respond to our users, uh, you know, in a, in a shortened turnaround time than what is average currently. And so we want to make a decision for things that don't are not difficult to make a decision about. Give people the code and then do more, whatever additional work we need to do. And then we'll reconcile that if you, if you make a decision. If it doesn't go through, then you'll know that. That should, in my mind, be a shorter time than the, the releasing the pre-release codes. That's the, yeah. And I think there are, you're in, this is new for us. And so you're you're sort of introducing some things that we need to think about and, and you know, refreshing here. Yeah, I, I would suggest, or, or at the end of this discussion, but there's more discussion that needs to happen internally. I think, because what you're, you're pointing out, I don't know the answer, because I wasn't part of these initial discussions, but we just got to look at this workflow. I, mean, I, I think what, what I sense, the ob objective process that we're describing here is that anything that's requested, you know, with, with some pretty big, gap, you know, kind of tall, short, I mean, short jump overs are going to get a code, right? And then and so what you're asking is, well, will that show up immediately in the pre-release list or not? And and I and I think it would, 
probably if, but that means that pre release <clears throat> that pre release list means something different than than it, than it currently does now and and so and then that gets to, to Jim's point you know I, I think we got to figure out okay having now that code one it has we have to deal with my question which is how much can we change the string request that was actually provided and then two what do we do with these things that sit there because once we decide that this process occurs um you know can we actually take things off say you lose um or not and and you know i i you know that's what it would be great to get some some solid input from from folks i i think i know what jim would say i think i know what i'm going to say too and that <laughs> unfortunately doesn't make me happy <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do a facilitation moment and, and then I'll come to you, Stan, which is how many more questions do we have in the audience on this subject? How many do we? Three. Okay, that let's try to get through those three questions in approximately 10 minutes and go on to other topics. And then, but first I'll go to Stan. Thank you. Yeah. This is a question or more of a comment, but I'm thinking about organizations like NCQA, where we can build value sets, EHRs. Um, if a lab gets assigned a temporary code and then you know they want their EHR vendors to start using it, NCQA to start including it in value sets and the impact um, of that, that there's a code out there, but there might be organizations whose policy say, you know, we don't include codes until they're published. I, again, it's not it's temporary. It's, yeah. I think we're talking yeah. about. it's a real code. It's a real code. It's just not a part of the published one. And that, that gets to that issue of the you know, status that allows them to still take it. It, it. it would be, yeah, it'd be perfectly reasonable policy to say, you know, NCQA doesn't use these things until they're either pre-released or released. Um, I think these are a different status. I don't, I don't think, I think we would now have a thing that would be essentially requested. So it's visible to everybody that has been requested. There's pre-release, which means that we think it's a good code. You can go ahead, you know, there's all 99%, it's been QA and then it's truly released. Uh, and you could make policies about, uh, I, I think what you would say is, we don't want to use any of these requested codes. <laughs> we may want to use pre-release if, you know, because those have been vetted, but certainly we want to use, you know, the fully released codes. So. Okay. Next question. Yeah. So with the opportunity to remove or deny a temp code, so that means I'm assuming that it gets removed. Uh, the temp. So is there any provisional chance? code? What's that? A provisional code. Okay. So if is there any opportunity for a provisional code that gets denied for that code to potentially be reissued in the future? No. 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 Absolutely not. That's what we're doing. That never happens. That's right. And this will be our last question, right, April? Yeah. Sorry. Um, in my perspective from the from the lab space, it takes three to six months for me to get to a pre-released code state when I ask for a new code. If you could shorten that gap to one month, is there really that big of a difference between two weeks and one month? And if there's not, why are we going through all of this work to think about it? Well, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, the right answer to this is fund us so we can assign codes within a week. Okay. That's not happened, hasn't happened over 20 years anyway. And and so that's the right answer. If we could get money, that's exactly what we would do. And there would be no no need for this. Uh, so that would be everybody's preference, I think, is that we just we get funded so that we can take care of this quickly. I agree. Uh, um, so uh just just a couple of wonderful, wonderful discussion on this, by the way. You know, just thinking from from what people said. Uh, number one, I think we want to we want to think of these as provisional codes. Uh, that's a better name. Uh, number two, you know, we ought to get into the details and just clarify exactly what our process is, because even in the two week period, for instance, 
you could negotiate and say you asked or in the in the period between when you requested the code and and when it was being approved the the meaning could change uh but if that meaning is agreed to then it doesn't matter in other words if if we made the code you thought it shouldn't be this but after we talk we both agree that it that it means this then that code you know it means what we agreed it to mean and you keep the code the other situation is that that it's redundant or denied or whatever uh for for whatever reason and in that case what i would say is okay then what it is a permanent code it's a it's a provisional code in that case what i would say to make it completely transparent you publish it essentially you publish it as a deprecated code <laughs> that says use this code instead use this other code instead in the case that it's redundant uh, and then you have traceability from you know what I started using as a provisional code in my system, and now I have traceability. I can use all my normal mechanisms for when we make that kind of correction for any like code that's wrong. So anyway, but we ought to just work through those nuances of uh, you know what happens if we just jointly agree during the the normal review period that the the, the meaning changes, or you know, or we agree during that period and say oh. We need this one, but we also need this other one. Uh, you didn't ask for that one. You know, what do we do? I think we would make two codes then. Uh, one would be provisional and the other one be, you know, anyway. Yeah. We just need to work through that so that we we have the process. And we'll probably we'll probably figure out in two weeks of doing this some other things that we forgot about. But uh, anyway. Um, thank you, everybody. I, I hope you got the flavor of the kind of dialogue that the co-chairs have among each other when, when we meet. And we have also, I think, maybe the flavor of, of our dialogue with our SNOMED partners, too, where they are able to give us useful input from their experience. And so we, it, we've actually been enriched by that in the collaboration. Um, and then finally, what we don't, what we get uniquely here is that cross community input and this is very valuable so thank you and our next topic is the updated radiology concept on but I, I should say Ken Wong was not able to join us today as the chair of the radiology committee so other people will be presenting so uh there, there's work going on there may be work beyond what i know uh i've been involved with isa and others in in discussions with the radiology folks and one of the current topics very interesting and very fun in a sense is uh the idea of series and sequences and what what that comes down to for instance uh especially is that uh it, you have an overall process like a CT scan on the head or something like that. And then you want to uh, discover or, or be able to describe things that happened in a certain part of that. Um, and one of, one of the interesting things is when you're using contrast or whether way you're doing other uh, interventions on the patient, like pushing on them or uh, having them flex or do something else, they want to be able to label uh, a part of that uh, series as uh, the you know uh, the period of time when the dye was injected, the period of time when the dye is washing out, other things, because they attach diagnostic significance to those events, and so we're thinking through the process of how how would we do that, uh, and all of the usual issues come into play in terms of whether you pre-coordinate or post-coordinate the information that you need in order to make those clinical decisions about the image. Uh, so uh, just some fun things that are going on there and, and easy may know things that I don't know about, but any, anything else there? Yeah. So uh, during the discussion, we had uh, several presentations about representing the piece of series and sequence as part of the long code. Uh, as you all know, the RSNA codes are uh, mapped to the RIDs 
or RPID it depends what it is representing, whether the full a name of long or just a part of it. But what they would like is that to add the series and sequence uh, attribute in addition to what long represents. Uh, they are not looking for something major as far as change, but they would like to be able to leverage the what the long code right now is representing and to put in addition the series and sequence attribute in addition to what we have right now as a concept model. Uh, representing the radiology concept. Uh, we came up with something proposed that is that is leveraging some of the attributes that's present right now in, in LOINC uh, to help in that uh, from that respect. Uh, and uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Ken and uh, other uh, committee members, uh, and we uh, proposed to them something that could be um, a potential something to think about going forward to extend uh, or to expand on the radiology procedure uh, representation and learning. Uh, so we came up with what you are looking at right now um, for a representing a procedure name, capturing the body part which is already represented but adding to that some anatomic plane, laterality, uh, the slice thickness, uh, scalp, dose monitoring, the IV contrast modality, uh, in addition to the uh, series and sequence that they are asking about, which is the slide thickness as well. Uh, they are not looking at something drastic, uh, but they would really like to leverage what is the attribute in LOINX, what is the basic six axis representative, but adding this additional attribute, uh, attribute to it and be a part of what is long code uh, expresses. Right. So uh, that's that's excellent explanation. Is a part of why this is cross cutting, is if you know we're working on Lloyd's concept model in ontology. If we're going to do that, then we need to uh, coalesce across all of our domains and committees, and that's why that's a cross cutting issue. The same is true for document ontology. Let's sort of you know have one sort of thought process in how we're going to. Uh, approach these things, taking, of course, into account the appreciable differences of the various domains. So I see um, Rob's wheels turning. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Um, so so first off, um, um, can you go, actually, can you make that thing go backwards? It goes okay. forwards, but it goes backwards. OK, so the things that we were, sorry, I'll, actually, I, I, we need to go back and forth. So, what was being added was series and sequence. So I don't see series and sequence in here. So this isn't the answer. This is what we're starting with, right? And then the answer is something that is more than this. Where's series and sequence? You're going to have to trade the mic back and forth. Oh, no. Let me, let me just say, it's a series and sequence that prompted this. Oh, so that was a generalized. Yes, yeah, this, that's why. It's, yes. Okay. All right. So, so this and this does answer the question. All right. So then, then it's here. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm not a radiologist, never, but I can play one on TV. Um, so the. Uh, so yes, to ease the things with or to to Marjorie's thing, and I and this is the same dilemma I'm trying to think through with document ontology, which means that what what we need I think to do is to lay out how this. The reason I'm kind of stumbling is that I really don't want to have to always fit things into these columns. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and um, but you've done that here. And, and 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 I know it, we had some conversations, I think, on the first day about there were some interesting, uh, you know, kind of distinctions with regards to timing. And I see that with IV contrast being timing. And there were two kinds of things I thought that, that had to do with when, well, it gets to exactly what you were just talking about, uh, Stan, this idea that there's like the, you know, the, the, um, I got dissolution in my head the, um, when the contrast leaves, you know, and looking at washout, thank you. Um, and which I, I, 
you know, it's certainly there's an element of time to that, but it's probably also function. Like, you know, if you're doing something and it happens, right? So, um, so I think we we need to. We're not going to solve it here today, but but I would like to see if we're going to stick with that those columns, <laughs> then how we you know this that we all agree like these things belong as a component, these things belong as a system and just understand why something is a system and not a component and all agree in all flavors, right? So that it works the same, so that it even makes sense in a document. That's one. <laughs> and then two, <laughs> as I should be. Um, and, then, and then I guess that means that are we ready to jump off a cliff? <laughs> and change all of that and um and i don't even know how you start to have that real conversation i obviously we can't change everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm because i really would like to i'd like to be free <laughs> yeah, so so stay tuned for that because rob you could probably stay here all day and figure out the issue <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're going to bring this up in the clinical committee agenda and figure out how that happens. I think there was a question for you, Dan. And we'll get to you next, Dan. Yeah, so I, I think it is feasible. Um, I think we've, we've demonstrated with the existing model and what's needed for this seems like a small enhancement relative to the overall approach that we've done. Two quick comments on what's here. The first is uh, we presently have IV contrast represented as a challenge, and I would, I think that is a good fit, and I don't think it's a, a, a timing fit. I think there may be other aspects related to what they're talking about with series sequence that are relevant to the timing, but the main sort of contrast part and its administration route should stay where it is. Um, I like also the idea of embedding some of this in the property, because right now for radiology procedures, it's like fine, everything's fine, and it's sort of a throwaway. Uh, and the idea that we might be able to um, define a way to understand which series and sequence relate to these more generic terms that are already sort of there, just by having a small tweak in the finding thing would be a helpful thing so that the rest of the attributes stay the same and are equivalent. Thank you. Oh, yes, Ethan, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, FYI, the, uh, we have gone through the um, the structure of what we have right right now for radiology in in Lyme. and between Stephen and myself, we dug into the deep depth of everything that had been worked on, and it was greatly worked on. And this is what we went uh, into mirroring what is needed currently from what has been already created before. So thank you for these um, comments. We look into that further. And uh, Dr. Mike is going to be providing us examples on mm -hmm. how the institution is going forward. Thank you. Thank you. So, who's next? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, all yours. Yeah. Go for it. Thinking a little bit about the road ahead. Let's switch out. Thinking a little bit about the road ahead. Um, you know, in our experience with um, assessment instruments, uh, which we're going to discuss later this afternoon. Um, you know, in the ontologic model, there are many, many more defining attributes of a of a, an observable concept. Um, and uh, in this particular one, there was a, a relationship to basically the um, uh, the technique that was uh, used um, in terms of the design of the assessment tool. And in this radiology example, if I understand their use case, they're talking about something like a radiologic protocol, which is a whole series of complex steps, a procedure, if you will, in SNOMED, but um, basically uh, that each have, you know, observational data popping out along the way. Um, and if you're uncomfortable with the notion 
And in, in the assessment tools, you know, we loosely define that as a special specialization of method. So you could sort of give lip service, if you will, to, you know, the like model. But um, there's more detail there that uh, I think they have a legitimate case to express. Now, whether it's in the information model or in the terminology model, you can argue. But um, if you're uh, uncomfortable with the notion of it um, as a, a, a specialization of method, if you will, um, and um, giving you the ability to define a, um, you know, a, a unique light code for the grouper, basically. I mean, we're talking about a light code for the, this is the protocol. In a way, it's a panel code. Um, and I, you know, I would just, you know, that's an example, Stan, of some of the, some of the stuff we ran into in clinical like, but so that's let, another yeah. discussion. This may not be exactly what you're addressing, but see, to me, this is, uh, essentially another example of the document ontology. I mean, what, what we've said with the document ontology basically is, we need a new ontological model and its axes would be named appropriately to what, what the content is. And, uh, you know, in, in a sense, forget about component timing system. I mean, if those are relevant, great. If we need additional ones, we name them. And uh, the real question behind this is, okay, then how do you, how do you now distribute these things that are part of the link but they're not observables in the case of the document ontology. Some of these things you could argue whether they're observables or not, but the, the point is that they have a different model and we want to be ontologically correct in how we define those. And then it's, to me, it's a, it's a very practical and important question. How do you then distribute that? But I think, you know, uh, yeah, we don't, we want, we don't want to be, limited in our definition of what this thing is because there are only six columns in the link table right now. So, yeah, <laughs> I feel like my toes are right over the cliff. Um, <laughs> so, uh, because one could imagine, I bet this would make Jim, this Jim happy, you're close Jim, not the far, well, maybe the far Jim too, um, that if we, if we become if we approach this in a free way, you know, say, oh, let's do, do something different. And then I think what we would need to do is, yes, we would look at the way Snowman models, you know, models, uh, observables and procedures, really. Snowman models procedures, the way fire models procedures. And if, and, you know, if we build upon that, we presume that to be correct enough, then um, then, then in essence, what LOIC would become in these in these spaces that we've decided, like so, radiology, I think is a pretty good one because it's definable, and I guess document ontology would be good because it's us and that's what we do. Um, we would uh, we would then become a place where you could get pre coordinated concepts. I mean, that's really what it would boil down to, right? And and it would be, I mean, the benefit of being. I don't know how well we can align, but if the benefit of being really aligned is that it literally becomes a place for pre-coordinated concepts where you can kind of pick and choose uh, how you want to manage it. I, I want to say that's a good thing. There's a little scariness to that, I think. Um, and, and, and I can see a little bit of the scowl and the, and the gem that's at the back. <laughs> <laughs> about the concern that we're going to become a place where you get pre-coordinated so many concepts, but but anyway, there you go. I said it. Um, point of order. Uh, can we have a break? <laughs> oh, that's a that is a very important point of order. What, I, any objections to taking a ten minute break? Any? All of those in favor, say aye. <laughs> all right. Aye, aye. Let's agree that we'll convene at uh, five minutes after two. Let everybody know during the break, we, we uh, assessed our agenda and um, we're going to drop the pre and post coordination uh, for this session and we will definitely come back to it. I can guarantee and it is on the, uh, on the agenda for the committee chair. So 
what work will continue on that one, but I think we don't have enough space to get that discussion in. So we have four topics and we'll give approximately 15 minutes for each topic and, um, you know, see how that goes. If a topic is going to need a little more, we got a little cushion. So, all right. Um, so our next topic, are we ready to move off of radiology and onto documentology, which is an overlapping issue anyway? Yeah. It, right, if you want your not the clicker, whoever wants the clicker. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's closer. Um, we've talked about this a lot. I don't know that there's a lot more to actually kind of introduce. The what is? Let's see, what is the next slide? Well, on the second slide, you're, ah, you actually okay, right. that. Yeah, right. So this is this is what we've done. Um, this was uh, so. These are the the top level attributes for for documents and each of these uh, these are not all of them actually but um but these are the ones that are the critical ones and uh as you've heard me say before there's some overlap mentally i think sometimes in the, across these and what we are attempting to do is is make the distinctions more more bright and um, and so we worked through a series of, uh, we went back and, and looked for uh, described definitions for these based on the original intent from the original publication. I think you were involved in that. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, as well as some other folks and, uh, that are here. And, and then we also looked at what other organizations that are participants in the process actually have decided that they mean, which was a useful addition. And um, and then summarized all that to some degree and came up you know in an open forum the, with these three. Um, I have in my mind that I thought we had actually done done the others, but yeah, no, the, the yeah, I don't, I don't, anyway. So these done them already. <laughs> these these are these are actually all of these are hard, um, but anyway, th th this is what we have. Uh, these are final, and uh, unless we run into you know something, we're not gonna. I don't think we're gonna change these based on what we're looking, gonna have. You have to do the, the fellow two, the, the lower two. But um, I, I would encourage folks to kind of take a look at this uh, and give us some feedback. Well, you know, publish and make this available. The other important part um, is that now that we have these. We need to look at the things that we say are one of these <laughs> and make sure that they seem to go along with that. And um, and we haven't done that. That'll be another important part. Uh, I have, there's a, there's a little, you know, I don't know if it's the devil or the angel on the side of my shoulder is saying that we actually need to do this for all of the subtypes too. Um, I don't, I, I would like to say that we might try and do that, but that's less important than getting the top ones done. And making sure that the ones that are underneath them actually fit that, that that's going to be our primary thing and then the other thing that that i've, I've alluded to is that um you know i'm all in on this alignment with snowman as you can tell and and so i would once we've done this it turns out i think there isn't a lot of structure in snowman already you know, it, that exists for um for what's it, record what was it record artifact um, that's that's what it is in Snowman, and and so you know we'll we'll work with Snowman folks to um, begin to characterize again that where where that's going to really have power is these things are these things are classes right these don't have any this has no meaning they don't ever say subject matter domain as a thing it's it's a it's a grouper and so what's going to really matter is the stuff as you see as examples in there that below that go belong it move on that belong below it and we'll look for those things in snowman right and I'm kind of get a sense of how that might fit or add them to snowman in the context of blank and um anyway so that's that's where we're going also yeah so i again this is a cross-cutting issue and i guess Rob, the expectation is that to work through some of these issues, then the clinical committee and document ontology will come together and, and 
sort of come to try and come to right. yeah no no excellent point um so so obviously some of these sub components i'll call them um are also reflected in the clinic in clinical work and uh and so that cross-cutting alignment needs to happen and will serve as a i would probably want to say a primary point of alignment even before even before snowman so we haven't done that yet again that's not that didn't happen here because these things don't exist in clinical life but but they're uh they're high they're ontologic children do and and so that's what we would need so you're right about that we have to do that and um and then that also this issue of what we just talked about about flying off the cliff as to how this fits into the overall lung structure and 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 then in creating a long common name how do we how do we identify you know do we you know if we go off into this space of saying we're not tethered to the five attribute column thing then um and what do we do <laughs> i think that's <laughs> what do you think Shan? are we okay with that <laughs> yeah. that would be easy <laughs> no i don't know do you have questions in the audience or comments? No? I'm not listening to anybody. Here's some. I do have a question. I mean, some of you use documents. No, 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 no. To me, to them. <laughs> so, I mean, some of you folks out there know you use documents. So, um, I know, you know when you ask this, especially when you got the lights in your face and you're so supposed to, but it's hard for people to answer. But you know, I I just wonder how much the community breaks these into the pieces, right? And that that's a critical component. And what you hear all of us terminology nerds do is that we talk a lot about the value of that. We even talk about when we when we're you know aligning with Snowmed that you would use a reasoner. To find the things that you want, um, I know that's probably blowing smoke, but um, but I'm just wondering if anybody was willing to say, yeah, you know, the we use that subject matter domain piece as opposed to I just take the code that's got all the coordinated knowledge and I just go look for it, five of them because they got the five things I want. You see the difference in what I'm saying? You know, one is. I, I know how something is built and I use that to go find the things that I, I need versus I just keep track of the codes and I don't really care that how you brought them together. I just kind of look at it as a human and decide. Anybody want to answer that question? Ooh, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, in uh, in uh, Ontario and also in British Columbia, we we use the line code, but we uh, use these attributes more than anything else. Um, I know the type of service definitely primary because it allows you to gather, you know, discharge and consonants and progress notes together. But in Ontario, they've gone even further, which is to be able to look at it by type of type uh, subject matter domain, which you know, some physicians want to see all of their cardiology stuff or audiology stuff, in which case, you know, the type of service doesn't doesn't help them, right? And in BC too, uh, I think it's um, British Columbia, sorry, type of service and subject matter domain are the primary ones and they're all less so. At, at the moment, uh, what we're trying to do here at Canada Health Employ is come out with some subsets or value sets which take the long parts you know so we have all of those that are published so they can slice it you know for canada and then for the provinces and then i, I guess there are local ones there that never get to the provincial or, or federal so that's what we're trying to do right now is it on yeah so uh 
we do use document types in SNOMED at present, not very extensively. We haven't used these components, but I think looking at those, we would use all three. Type of service, definitely. Subject matter domain, probably. Role, yes. So I think that actually would be more useful than the pre-coordinated document types in the end, in the long run. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Well, thanks, Rob. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? No. Okay. All right, then we are going to go on to points for existing attributes in measure structure, message structure, scan that you use. We need to enter. That's rolled when he saw this. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so, you know, uh, this comes, kind of, well, I'm, I'm biased. And so it's interesting to have this discussion about, uh, at this stuff, because I, uh, we work with models that again, get translated into other models. So we're talking about, um, you know, loint models or other models that then get transferred into fire that then get transferred into OMOP that then get transferred into C disk that then get transferred into N into NCPDP script, etc. And uh, and so it's helpful if the semantic elements that participate in the models have a code so that you have a meaningful code that says uh, this item is, I mean, it's it's like meta on meta because it would say this code specifies the uh, the item that's being ordered, or this is the code that specifies the patient's last name or first name, or actually not even patient's first or last name. It, it's, it's a part that uh, semantically means the person's uh, a person's last name uh, and that makes it possible essentially then that when you're mapping between different modeling systems uh, or actually different transport systems or different syntax uh, exchange syntaxes then you have uh, a semantic foundation or doing the translation. So essentially it becomes, you know, you're trying to create a Rosetta Stone that says this, this concept means last name and, and that concept, then you can start making maps that say in, in uh, fire uh, patient, you know, it, it has this name and in HL7 version two, it has this name and in CCDA, it has this name. Uh, and so you start seeing it, it, it's the foundation for doing that. Uh, I don't honestly know how many of these, I mean, probably the big worry is how many of these are there, uh, you know, individual parts, but it's it's a different kind of thing, but that's that's the use case about why, why I want to, and uh, why it would be useful to me. Um, so I, I welcome comments and thoughts uh, about that. Um, yeah, I want to make line codes that capture this the, the foundational semantics of the elements that are used in models like C disk and HL7 version two and buyer and script, etc. So Stan, is the intent that the sole purpose of these links, point codes is to provide that mapping between the different models? Or because I think that you run the risk of people actually looking at those link codes and saying, oh, look at that, I've got a link code, I can put it in an observation and it says patient first name and the value is X. Yeah, you, you need to identify them. Now, by the way, I mean, this, you are probably part of it. Uh, we actually have link codes already that say last name, first name. And that came about because of our relationship to the uh, regional and something, something is the oncology guys. They had, you know, they had um, a standard for transmitting oncology data that was a delimited 
a, a delimited file and that nacer nacer people uh yeah uh and so yeah so they exist now and what what it says on them you know is that they shouldn't be used <laughs> observation identifiers uh they're only used so that it, 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 we, we created them so we could make a map between the NACER standard and, and HL7. Uh, so you're right. Uh, if we did this, I think we would want to have some way of annotating them as not, not observations that should be sent. You know, they shouldn't be used as observation identifiers, I guess. To me, um, this is a little bit ambiguous. Um, you're talking about creating like codes for each of the instant value instances that populate. Oh, okay. No, no. We're, we're quite close to the yeah. nodes and syntactic representation. So, and it's not, it's not just messages. So the general problem is that um, most, most production computer systems today um, uh, you have a different way of identifying essentially a data element into which you populate a semantic code to represent meaning in collections. Um, and uh, there is no kind of universal standard across all technologies way of identifying such elements. I mean, in um, XML structured um, uh, 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 data sets like fire, for instance, you can use things like firepath or XML. You use XPath that can uniquely identify a particular item. In something that is a serialized linear delimited format, um, uh, some uh, going way back decades and decades, you know, you had the column numbers and punch cards, you have the field ID in the sequence of the record. Um, so the different technologies use a different way of uniquely identifying a data, a data element. Turns out this is a large part of the expense and complexity in model mapping. And um, so assigning some kind of standard universal unique identifier to an element, regardless of if it's an XML structure or a table structure, or a database structure or a column Excel spreadsheets, wherever it might appear that has some kind of a unique identifier that gives you a lingua franca between different data representations for messaging, for persistence, for reporting, for whatever that allows you to do model mapping and makes it computationally tractable so you can build machines that help do this. And because Line codes, we're using them for lots of things. We have line parts and line answers, lots of line codes. And because there's been articulated certain issues specifically about um, translating between um, uh, coded semantic categories and positionally defined categories in message structures, um, there's been a, a desire to make line codes for um for these things which in 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 the, the language we're using for the subset of that problem we're working with is for attributes and models but it's a general problem of tagging data in computer systems it's a tag data issue and we don't have a universal standard for the tag definitions and this is a first piece to solve approximate problem to to take care of that I think we had another Yeah, so I agree that there is a problem here to be solved, but I would argue strongly that it is not up to like to address this particular problem. I think you should be very careful of your scope, which is observations and documents and radiology apparently. But still <laughs> careful of your scope. Um and look for other standards that already solve this problem. There's a whole semantic web community out there, which has a whole mechanism for merging standards. And I assure you there is a, there are standards there that 
allow you to specify perfectly well the last name and the first name and street address, etc., cetera, of a function. It's not a clinical information item that, I mean, it's used in a clinic, but it's not inherently clinical. And so I don't think it should be an, in a clinical standard that creates codes for this. You're wasting your resources if you do. Hey, Paul, is there another hand up? I can't see. Yeah. Any other comments at the chair's table? I agree no. with the last comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, maybe we want to. Uh, would you like the clicker, Pam? I think you're mad. Sure. Yeah. And now for something entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in this cross cutting topic, um, this was brought up by Dr. Xavier Denzel from last year's sponsor, BioMario, uh, at the time that the Lab One Committee was working on the semi quant uh, scale. And uh, he proposes that there needs to be an improved communication between uh, Reagan Street and the end users within the database by having a standardized, uh, more of a specification of certain uh, field elements. Uh, it started out with, I believe, uh, change underscore type, but he's also bringing in change reason public um, and I think one other version last change status, status reason, status tech. I think they would all interfold together. Um, and maybe we need to have some sort of a legend uh, and standard structure of, of uh, answers so that when a release comes out, and I realize every organization probably ingests a like release differently, um, there can be kind of a handshake between the end users uh, reading the information and the uh, and the intent of the database. So I guess I'm asking, is this a pain point for anyone in the audience? Um, or any insights or thoughts? Examples on the screen are just for uh, mm -hmm. recent, uh, in the most recent release, uh, a major change in the change type field uh, was for the analyte and method uh, having rest class taken from the component field and added to the method field, uh, while a minor change was the semi-quant uh, titers, uh, the titer property was changed over in scale, and that was given as a minor change. It took a year to do that minor change. But, no, sorry. <laughs> Time and cheap. We're good. Yeah, so, so that, that would be very helpful for us. We, we use a long subset, uh, about 6,000 codes. And we have translated them to Dutch, and we have a standing policy that um, in a new long release, new long version, any code that's changed in a major way should be reviewed. But and right now, we're just taking a kind of stab at what is major or what is minor. So this would really be helpful because we could make a list, list of what has to be checked shorter and more to the point. So I would really welcome this. So. Are there any other questions? Pam, I had a comment. Better follow up. Um, I, I think the point that our colleague makes here is a really important one. One of the things we found in doing change reporting, tracking, and management in the terminology, um, editing modification in the HL7 terminology, um, I, we had to look at major versus minor changes not by the scope of the change in terminology, how hard they were to do or expensive, but um, what was the effect on the user community? So if we felt a major change means you've got to update your content in your terminology server, the first, first opportunity, and it might contain breaking information, minor change meaning you can put it off, it's not critical, it's not going to break anything, we'll be back with compatible, we actually use semantic versioning, three fields, minor, uh, major, minor patch, and a patch change by something like a, you know, fixing a spelling typo and a definition, or something that didn't change any processing of the data, any validations, um, any logic um, for processing the content, 
Um, it was strictly user interface service form stuff. And we ended up adopting that kind of thing, focused on the users of the terminology, not what the authors felt it was or how much trouble it was or expense. So you may want to consider that. I uh, kind of used one HL7 to do that based on user mm -hmm. community feedback we got. Yeah, I, I agree. I think what we're having is various levels of granularity of discussion. So Pam, you know, you're sort of in that the terminology database level. Um, uh, Ted's raised it a bit but more. I want to go to the conceptual level. Um, I'm recommending that we do that on what uh, constitutes a major change or minor change and making sure we're all on the same page with that because all of the other levels uh, depend on that. And if we don't agree, then it, you, know, you won't get the consistency that you want. Yeah, I, I just want to highlight the, the work that was done at HL7 that Ed led with some others in terms of compliance. It wasn't straightforward how to figure out what was a major minor change and a, and a patch change and to try and adopt semantic um, semantic versioning for terminology that it was done and, and uh, you know with I don't even know how much modification probably not quite honestly we could adopt that I think so first you know I think you're saying we have to figure out what our difference is and, and I'm, I'm saying that I think that's kind of true but we have to decide we're going to actually do this because right now we're versioning by date so um so our first decision is is that we're going to communicate Chain types of changes, and, and this this I think what you're hearing from a, from everybody is that we should do that. I, I think then you don't have a choice but to semantic version because doing anything else is just going to make you out of sync, make us out of sync with the way that the um, the community is going. It does mean you have to make this decision about what those three fields mean, and luckily that's been done for you by HL7 to a large degree. And then um, we just implement that, and uh, and then our community will tell us how they're able to ingest it. But I think, um, in my opinion, this is a done deal. We have to do it. So are you, and you're saying with the three fields, we that's sort of the conceptual approach of what's a major change, what's a minor change, what's a, a technical thing. But I'm not sure we're all on the same page from a regulatory perspective with that. You know, and, and I think we need to have that discussion. Yeah. And the other levels of discussion then fall into place. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a good example. What you're seeing here is that major change is, in fact, a version change for for uh, for like, and even though you know, Link's got all these different components, so it can be a little bit confusing. But I, you know, I think you can overthink that. I mean, if you've made this change in lab, it's a version change, even though the document ontology didn't change at all, right? And then, right, and then. And then these, um, you know, that first bullet in the in the minor changes is actually um, a patch, and probably the second and the third are. The third one might actually be a version change, but the second one is a is a. What's the middle one called again? If I come on, minor. So that would be a minor change. We have at least two more uh, questions, comments. So a question, and this is going back a little bit. I haven't looked at this recently, but is the change type field being consistently populated with each release? Because there was a point in the past with the link table. Now, this is before the link table core was actually released, where not all changes actually got flagged in the change type. Uh, and that created problems for reporting at the implementation level. So um, which fields actually does the change type apply to may also be a question that we need to ask, or does it apply to all of them? And if it applies to everything in the link table, is the change type flag being set in each case? I, I can tell you that, you know, I've, I've seen examples, I'm looking at you, Isaac, <laughs> where when, we, when that was first being published, I don't know if they've if it's been improved, but the, everything was a change, right? I mean, it was just a change. And and so what we need to do, I think, and I, I actually am not familiar with what we're doing currently, but it needs to be a, as specific as we can get it, right? Because that's, otherwise, 
otherwise why do it because all you're doing is just telling people there's more work for them to do so um, so i agree and, and there's work for us to figure out how to be clear so i can shed some light on the historical context here which is that there is a consistent approach and definition to what these change types are but it might not be solving the problem that people are asking so there's a definition for each of these for example a name is a change to the analyte field number two if there's a change in that boom it gets the name change it's a major change if there's a change to a name field other than that one so the other four parts of the name three four five six seven etc and a minimum change would be a change to a field other than the name part so that goes like across the rest of the different attributes so that is and has has been typically an automated you know right. Uh, assessment. There's also an additional file that had more detailed description of field by field changes that was added more recently. It's called the, uh, what is it, change something or other, uh, change snapshot. Okay. But those are, I would say, easy to implement, but in terms of detection of what the changes are, but don't necessarily capture the significance right. to the perspective of implementer. And I think that's the definition. I just want to clear up that right. there are definitions and they've been clearly implemented. It's just that we might be wanting something slightly different than what's been done. Yeah, I, I think you're, what you, I mean, based on what you just said, what I would say is that that's not communicating what we're talking about communicating. So we're talking about something different that's aligned. And that what I'm saying, that is being automatically generated wouldn't align with the um what what it sounds like it's the where it's really valuable is is that it's pointing to a specific thing that got changed that's really critical i think as a starting point that in and of itself is going to be super powerful but I would say that what we just described, and particularly in alignment with the definitions that have been applied in HL7, the use of the words major and minor are aligned. And one clarification just for the audience, the change type is applied at the concept level. So what you're actually sort of implying is applying semantic versioning to the concept level, the row level change, and not just overall that sort of a version for the terminology as well what i'm what i'm saying is that you you roll up the changes that are at a concept level to define the the version for that release right so if you have only a bunch of concept level uh patches you have a patch change but if you have 20 patch changes and one minor change you have a minor release and if you have zero patch changes and 10 minor changes but one change like this RAS project generated you have a new version and then the change log tells you the details that's what i'm saying we have a comment online from jeremy oh, jeremy thank you. would you like to make a comment i was i was just going to comment based on some of the other comments that were previously uh, given, that the uh, from a perspective of looking at the data coming through in the file, the major and minor changes are really helpful, but like others had kind of stated, any additional details surrounding that would be really beneficial to some of the end users, as the major and minor uh, changes don't necessarily align with what might represent major and major, minor changes uh, to the end user. Um, like the semi-quant modification, uh, impacted a lot more of the content that I currently work with than some of the major changes with the RAS project. So any additional details would really be helpful. Yeah, that, that, this is Rob. That's what I was saying. I think that last bullet in the minor change is a major change. So I think we have work to do to figure out exactly what really is truly impactful, but we're all in agreement. And that's what Ted was saying is that uh, you know a version change, i.e. a change in the number of the top level is a major change to it and implementer. That's what we're targeting. We're, we're good. Okay. Well, thank you all. Another really great discussion. And Pam, you still have the floor. Right. And with our, I think this will be our last one with the um, with the amended agenda. Um, so patient-generated health data collection. This one 
if, if you'll recall a long time ago when point of care devices first came out and laboratories had a new augmented reporting system because it was either a, a lab test was either performed in the laboratory, which had a CLIA certificate, um, had all sorts of accreditation versus there was a, a glucometer sitting on the countertop somewhere. There was there was a lot of um, contention on, can those have the same LOIC codes? Does that glucometer un go, undergo the same rigor that a, a certified laboratory instrument does? And so now we have a new wrinkle in the world with the influx of smartphones uh, and their and their density around the world. And uh, it came to light from the National Kidney Foundation that an organization produces a microalbumin creatinine ratio test kit for use at home in which they collect a spot urine, they use a dipstick, and they place the dipstick on a uh, printed colored uh, legend and they took a picture with their smartphone and it's interpreted by the smartphone camera as to the concentration of the microalbumin and the creatinine and then it's uh, calculated to be the the ratio now there is a heatus measure for this one and the laboratorians were um, fairly ruffled that the same light code could be used for the smartphone calibrated result versus their laboratory instrumentation. So um, we looked around and found that's not the only instance of, of things going on in the world with the smartphones. Um, there are, is also a loop mediated isothermal amplification of nucleic acid without uh, that's being read by a smartphone. And so we have a variety of Yes, yeah, so there's a, I have a lot of links embedded here for you to go back and, and geek out on all the different things that can be done to increase um, information about a patient's condition brought forward from the patient themselves and how that's going. And, and Dan has been has presented in the past about how your your um, your Apple Watch has light codes in it. Um, and so there's just a lot of things to think about. Um, another scenario is the continuous glucose monitoring that takes place, the Abbott Freestyle Libre system. Um, that was suggested that they use capillary blood loink for that monitoring. However, the package insert indicates that it's interstitial fluid, which I don't believe we have as a registered, as a recognized system just yet. Um, Abbott has plans to go a lot further that the freestyle libre system is my understanding is for insulin dependent diabetics but there's also going to be a new one out for um uh type one uh diabetics and then uh there's also a dexcom is going to do a light uh light sensor for pre-diabetic conditions and so there's going to be a ton of lot of data coming forward, is it going to be necessary for doctors to realize that the data being presented is from your watch uh, when it comes to um, situations where they may then do medications? So um, yeah, I'd like to open the floor here for, um, I, and I think one other thing, uh, the last link, the Babson Diagnostics, you know, there was an interruption in the in the veil with the Theranos company a couple of years ago. Uh, but Babson Diagnostics have taken, in my opinion, has taken some uh, lessons learned from that scenario. And there is indeed kind of the model of go into your pharmacy, have some capillary blood taken, and have some laboratory enzymes run. Um, so that, that may also be another another consideration. So I'll just open the floor to see how people feel about it. I imagine that there are many other types of wear bio wearables or sensors that are impacting um, clinical, I don't know about radiology, but anyway, I open the floor. First of all, this is endlessly fascinating. Thank you for bringing it up. And I did want to help make this connection between there's a, a project with NHL7 still going on. It was uh, spawned in 
the COVID context for at-home tests um, here, but was designed in such a way that it wasn't limited to only those kinds of tests. But importantly, it is important that we recognize there are other structures in our communication features to be able to carry a lot of additional information. And so, for example, in this guide, of course, there's a link to a device, and that device might be the smart home and it can or the smartphone and its app and can carry a lot of that metadata about what it is that's sort of making this observation. But importantly, we uh, pointed to you know, Livid as the sort of collection of the value set for the for finding the concept codes. And I think this dialogue with the manufacturers in this case is another opportunity, I would say, to strengthen voice connection to you know these companies, I think would be crucial for getting the definition right. And ideally we can, you know, keep you know, driving that home like we want them to be at the table being requesting and and having that flow sort of that coding flow downstream because effectively in sort of an app-based model it can be built right into the software and so nobody has to map anything because it's sort of already there if they take that to heart from the beginning so i just want to underscore those two things one thank you for the connection we'd love to keep you know discussing in the context of this fire ig but two, I believe the connection to the manufacturers of these is, is crucial to getting the modeling right. Um, yeah. uh, I see this as part of uh, even a more general issue that's being uh, tackled by SHIELD. So the general question is, what information do I need to know so that I can accurately interpret a lab result? or for that matter, any observation. And so if you extend this further, see this this is one one thing is, you know, the device you use to, to do it, it turns out people are also saying, um, and this came out of COVID as well, uh, beyond the device, I wanna know who produced your reagent because they turned out to be very, very different based on who was producing you know, they had very different sensitivities and specificities based on who produced the reagent. And uh, and then you get in, anyway, you get into other circumstances. And so the idea is, probably the important question to see is, what are we, what's the information we put in the white code and what kind of information do we allow or require be sent in other fields in terms of the, you know, we, we require right now that you send the units of measure with, you know, it doesn't mean anything if you just send me a number and don't tell me whether it's milli equivalents per liter or whatever. Uh, we already require that. But, you know, if I had to do it over again, see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have um, asked people to send pre-coordinated light codes with their method. What I would ask is that the light codes never had the method and that you were required, though, to send a method in another field. So it becomes part of the information model that you're using in the transaction rather than the semantics of the code. Because obviously, we don't want to make light codes that say, you know, agent from company A and reagent from company B. And that's where that that's that's un, unmaintainable. Uh, but there are other things besides the reagents. I mean, and, and it's a potential long list of things uh, that you might want to put there. Uh, so there, there's there's work going on with Shield, and I think we should we should work, we should work with Shield on the more global problem of and uh, and it, it comes down to, you know, some of these things are um, lots of interesting discussion about reference ranges versus normal ranges. And you know, the reference ranges could be good, but you have to understand what they mean as well. Reference according to what? So uh, they want to know, you know, if you're going to do that part well, then it implies that uh, the laboratory or whoever is doing the analysis or assigning the reference range has to know whether I'm male, female, postmenopausal, uh, you know, uh, post kidney transplant, post, I mean, there's a whole to do that. So it's it's oh, this is an incredibly fun and and complex sort of thing. The the root though is people want and need to know how how do I determine whether this measurement is comparable and I can plot it and I can use it, you know, in caring for a patient or in research and know that it's comparable 
regardless of uh, or, or or what are the circumstances when it's comparable versus when I could you know when do I have to put it on a different line or in a different column because uh, it's really not comparable. Yeah, if I can, I, I mean, that last thing you said is what I had in my head that we would want to use as our way of helping decide whether um, it belongs inside the link or not. But um, but then if if I don't even think that works because if um, the difference in these other pieces of information that we aren't including in the link mean that you have to put it in a different column, then we always have to keep adding things into the link whenever they make a difference as to whether you can compare. And, and I'm hearing you say that, that that actually can happen via a lot of things like this reagent and stuff like that, which we don't want to put into the links, which makes yeah. me think, <laughs> yeah, right. so yeah, so so then that's not a good characteristic to use as a def defining characteristic. I mean, about about um, whether it's a new link or not. So, um, you know, I you know I worry about circling that hole a little bit, and and so then you're left with well. Um, Does personal preference, <laughs> you know, in a sense, like what we've got now, right? As it does that kind of okay, you know, until someone really pushes hard to say something else, and um, and then we just kind of highlight the fact that provenance, you know, for these particular things, because we started to kind of get far field a little bit, but this this also this issue this this came up a lot when I was also participating in the COVID thing. And I was I was really worried about them when they first started to do this and they were using blank codes for for in in lab tests. And I really raised the stink about that, that these were not the same when you were having a patient say I'm positive for a COVID test based on, you know, doing a nasal swab at home. That that needed to be a different code, that we needed to be able to do that. But Honestly, now I'm not sure how to where that sliding scale stops, and because uh, I was saying you needed another code and you needed provenance, you needed to say. I mean, that's why, as a clinician, I wanted to know that that had been reported by the patient. Um, I don't. I, I'm just sitting here trying to come up with a summary statement. I don't even know what it is. Well, a couple, a couple other thoughts here. Um, the 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 use cases when you want to compare when when you allow to compare things are not consistent either and other, and so i don't we don't we don't want to create line codes based on only one use case uh in, in other words if certain kinds of research i can imagine that it, it would be fine you know, I, I in my research, I may want to use home, you know, glucometer glucoses the same as laboratory measured ones. In other situations, if I'm, you know, if it, it it could be entirely different. So there's there's how we make blank codes, and then what I'm imagining is that we need to make sure in the messaging standards that there's a place to put all of that other information. And then I think it's actually other organizations that say, this is what we accept as uh, comparable for our purposes. And, and so there's really a rule base now that says, oh, you know, for my purposes, I don't care anything that says glucose and the component, I'm cool. And there are other people that are gonna say, well, I need to obviously need to distinguish random from uh, fasting. And other people that are going to say, I, I, I need to separate it based on a glucometer versus uh, a lab, you know, a, a CLIA certified laboratory. Uh, and, and so I don't think we can make those judgments about what is comparable. What we need to do is make absolutely clear or make, make it possible for people to send any information that may uh, be needed for any of the use cases uh, about com comparable data. Yeah, so 
I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said, Stan, except for the problem is that the genie's out of the bottle because we have method. So well, there, there it's so hard to figure to out the boundary that meet, meets everything. Right. There, there is a boundary that you can say they're absolutely not. Okay. We'd never say urine glucoses are equivalent to serum glucoses. Sure. Never, ever. Uh, and so that there's there there are some things that we can so, we can root this in. So so for example, the the initial well, so not the initial, but anyway, the use case that it's always in my head is that Libra. And then the, okay, well, we should talk about that versus the versus the COVID. So so Libra would have we need to add interstitial fluid if that's what they say it actually is. So that that seems straightforward. Then that issue of well, can you compare a Libra um, A1C number to because I, I think they actually generate A1Cs. They probably generate the other stuff too, but um, to something else is up to the organization that receives the code because they're going to get a different code for a Libra one from one that is based on serum, right? They're going to get a different code, whereas the COVID test is going to be the same and they're going to have to figure out what they need in order to make a decision right and so but i'm still back and i don't I'm, we're not going to solve this but i'm still we we packed a bunch of stuff we're talking about packing a bunch of stuff now thankfully i think we're going to pull radiology out but but into method but i know that there's a lot of stuff that gets packed into method even in in lab and we're going to have to make some decisions about no more stuff like that into method you know even if we are clear about about specimen right that's that's where i'm kind of going yeah and and i think there's a the possibility that we're conflating two issues one one is how much you want to pre and post coordinate and um do we want to make pre-coordinated codes even though the rule would be uh if you will the preferred representation would always be post post coordinated they're, they're just use cases where the pre-coordinated thing is so dang handy, you want to make it anyway. Yeah, no, and, and we've always been open to that. I get it. Yeah, that, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Are we going to make pre-coordinated codes? That was just the same thing that we talked about before. That's what this, you know, that's what, that's what this conversation about is how much stuff do we put in to ours codes versus say, no, use the same code, even though you might want to put them into different columns based on this other information. And that's, that's what we're being asked to decide. Yeah. And, and I, and I, you know, I like bright lines. So right. I think that we need to have, you know, with some, with some escape clauses, I get that, but, you know, but the problem is once you do an escape clause and you say, yeah, but this is a really important one and it's distinct and we want to make this, we're going to add this one new method and everybody's going to look at it. Well, God, how come they got their method and I didn't get mine. So I, send money. Oh, no. <laughs> Not, not wrong. Yes, my money's question. One, one additional thing. I'll try and be quick here. Um, there has been uh, that this is sort of a little bit tangential, but not too much. Uh, there, there have been discussions and of uh, quote unquote whether loin codes are safe to use for patient uh, care, and there's been an argument made that they weren't. And 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 I've made a you know a, a pretty concerted effort to say yes they are if you understand kind of you, you understand the context in which they were intended to be used and these are used in messages and there's always other information that you need uh, to to understand about this including the reference range the units of measure the methodology other things and now people are saying more. Uh, and I actually had uh, a discussion with with the person, and and it helped a lot to understand that because what what was happening uh, was they were being at th th there are a set of a set of people that she pointed me to that are saying the only thing we need to do uh, to to map lab data is to make is to match something to a loin code. And their assumption was, if it's mapped to the same line code, it's comparable for all purposes. And I said, we got to, you know, uh, we've got to educate people that never been true, and it's not true now. 
and and somehow we've got to educate that population of people to say that's not sufficient it's never been sufficient uh and uh so i just wanted to bring that up because uh it was an issue and i it turned out that it it was it, it was about that basically uh the person was being forced to map things and uh and it, it was actually uh one or more EHR companies that said, look, you just need to map this line code. Uh, that's good for all purposes. And uh, it means that this data is comparable. And that's just not true. And so somehow, I think it's a minority group that are thinking that, that somehow we've got to educate people, but that's never been the case. It will never be the case that you can assume because it has the same white code that it's valid for all use cases and all purposes. Yeah, and can I just comment on, you know, the, but <laughs> so part of the problem is, is that, and that's absolutely true. It's true across line, but there are some places where it's less true than others. So for example, the document ontology. <laughs> so we just, you know, our messaging just needs to be really clear. And I think one of the, well, I don't know that actually changing the model is going to make it even clearer, make it muddier, but but I think that that we need to, we just we need to do a better job of messaging. One comment on the same area. It occurs to me this ties in a little bit to one of the earlier issues we talked about of having a um, a global unique identifier for a field of metadata that is not part of terminology model. That's expected to be carried in the message structure of the database structure. Um, do we need to think perhaps that in some cases, loin codes may benefit from a structure that lists the other items that are needed in order to make them comparable? Because that's a way to extend this notion to make it machine uh, readable. Oh, it's an enormous it's an enormous amount of work. So you can only do it piecemeal, only where it was important for patient safety, or where you had a grant that said we want to do this for this this set of things. I mean, you could you it's too much work to do wholesale. Yeah. And and the the, the cost may not the, the juice may not be worth the squeeze to do it wholesale. Well, it's the message. You're right. But it may be worthwhile to consider that we're starting to talk about some of the fundamental building blocks that would make such a thing possible. It's not possible today. It will be that. Some additional food for thought on that concept of method and how it may be used uh, in too many different ways. In toxicology, it's common to use screen versus confirm as the method type. And in my experience, that's completely useless. It may have been helpful back in the day, but now it is utterly uh, not helpful because um, most people would think of the screen as an enzyme immunoassay for whatever drug you're looking for and the confirm as a mass spec assay. Well, we do all of our screens on mass spec. So how am I supposed to correctly map that code now? I can't. And so now I'm using a method list code, which isn't great either. So I think we should be careful about what we stick in that Submit. method. Changes. <laughs> if we leave you with one thought, <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to submit more hundreds and hundreds of more. Um, but 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 there's also the uh, here's another example. Um, you know, in infectious disease, you want to separate out those antigen tests from those PCR tests because they have different levels of specificity, right? So now, do I need to separate out regular PCR from droplet digital PCR? Is that have to be set? like how, where do we go? Yeah, well, that's exactly what we were just talking about. So, so do do you need to separate them? I mean, is you're asking us if we need to, but I'm wondering, do you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. That, that's fair. And in the toxicology example, I feel uh, more confident. In the yeah. droplet digital, uh, it it depends on the specialty, right? In some specialties, that absolutely makes a difference because I can get down to one thing. In other specialties, getting down to one thing is not exactly the importance of the droplet digital PCR. Yeah. So it's I mean, complicated. I, I see the method thing exploding, exploding. But 
I don't know how we can get around it, honestly. <laughs> um, do we have another question? Can, okay. I say, can I say one thing about the method thing? And then we'll so the there is, there is, yeah, there is one thing that we've, we've alluded to elsewhere that we haven't talked about in this context, but we talked about it in genetics. And, um, and that is, well, I don't know if this is a solution, but uh, and thankfully it's not a document ontology problem, but um, the, the idea of pointing to another terminology, right? Which is essentially what we're saying when we say pointing, pointing to another part of the, of the um, exchange structure. And, um, and that's really what the answer that, that you, you did when you took a methodless uh, point code, you're, you're saying use, use this other place to get that information. And, um, and so perhaps part of the answer is to actually create less blanks, more that have, well, methodless or whatever, probably a lot more methodless that, that in essence are a flag to go and get other information. Now, having said that, I think a lot of people presume that they're going to get the method information from the link. So, um, so having said that, I'll finish by saying is then we need to think about if there's a way in Loink that as a part of the link, we point to that other code system. And then the Can I ask a question? <laughs> oh, can we get it? We'll go to our question. That's, yeah. Sorry. Um, so I was triggered by something Stan said uh, about 15 minutes ago, but now I guess um, <laughs> that, that we wouldn't compare urine glucose to serum glucose. Very true. Very yeah, it's always going. Um, on the other hand, this morning, uh, someone brought up the XXX uh, codes. So there's also a case where indeed you do compare something with different specimens. Um, on the other hand, in this particular instance, I think this uh, patient-generated uh, item is a flag that will always apply. It's always a warning signal that this data is not to be completely trusted. We should probably be replicating this test in a controlled environment. And that to me seems a hallmark of a separate data element, not something you want to put in that link element and not actually as such a method because it implies much more than a method. Also, um, that it's patient generated doesn't mean you now know what method it was because you probably need to know which wearable, which app, and so forth. Anyone feel that there's one, any pressing question, anything they want to say um, or before we close this out? Um, as you can see, a number of the roads here lead to pre and post coordination, and clearly we're going to come back to that in the future. So that will not disappear from our radar. Um, last year, and I will again this year say, this was the most tiring session we had <laughs> because of the level of detail and, and thought and, and uh, expertise that is at the table and the concentration it takes to try to digest all that and, and, and engage with it is really a lot. And so I, I feel this audience was fantastic and you brought to us many thoughts that we would have never had among ourselves and that's really really important to doing the work well and um i also think we're going to think about how to build this in next year you know and we might take some different approaches um not because this didn't work but, but i can see opportunities to you know even glean more information from all of you and others who you know will be here so Thanks to everyone. I, as you can see, I am so fortunate to work with this group of people, and I'm so fortunate to have all of you to help our work. So, and Marjorie is going to give us our closing remarks. No, oh, you're, going, you're going to introduce our closing remarks. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi again, my friend. Found this. Uh, what did? You, well, how did you describe it, Virginia? You said it was not a tire. Well, intellectually kind of demanding. But that's, that's actually a good thing. 
Well, I just have, uh, and thank you everyone for coming and being interested in that one. I just have a, a few minutes, a uh, few comments before uh, Stan closes us out uh, officially for the, for the week. Um, first, thank you for coming in and for your participation and contribution that made this conference uh, very insightful and impactful. We really do appreciate that. So these last few days, again, my adjective is outstanding. Um, I hope you found it outstanding as well. Um, I hope you leave this conference with, actually I need a slide up, please, um, with <clears throat> uh, new learnings and uh, fully empowered to drive change. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Safiyan and Lingmo for their Generous support. Again, we are grateful for your sponsorship, your confidence in your work, in our work, and um, your participation in the conference. So thank you to Lima and Sophia. <laughs> and it is okay. So uh, it's extremely important that I thank my colleagues. Uh, from the health and data standards team um, who worked, uh, you can do it right, but who worked tirelessly to bring this conference to fruition. Um, our software engineering team, uh, Ross Barrietta, Tim Briscoe, and Stephen Wagers, the terminology team, Isa Hafiza, Elizabeth Lumikowska, Cynthia Lundberg, Felicia Owens, and Jeffrey Moratimo. Our operations team, April Lackey and Jennifer Pianchi, who often work behind the scenes, but are lunchpins nonetheless. And our trusted advisors, David Biorto, uh, Virginia Rio, and Stan Huff. You all are simply the best. Uh, thank you for your incredible work in uh, delivering this conference and uh, all that you do every day. Thank you to the team. I have one last request of all of you uh, before I turn the floor over to Stan, and that is that you complete the post-conference survey that should be coming by email. Is that true, Tim? Okay. Um, it helps us a great deal when you complete that survey. So Stan, over to you. I think we're done. I think I'll go back. Yeah. Um. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. And I just second appreciation for all of uh, Regan Streep and Marjorie and the whole team for, for the meeting. Uh, great. I just had a few thoughts uh, and I want to share those. Hopefully, not, I won't take too long. First of all, it, we just an expression of appreciation for Clem McDonald and his foresight and his energy to start Moink 30 years ago um, and and to come to the point where we are now where we can argue about these nuances of and all all of this was enabled because we did something we we created something uh, and from from the from the perspective of creating it and then using it, we've learned things and then we can get more sophisticated and better and uh, it just goes forward. But uh, just to acknowledge Clem uh, for his genius in thinking about this and and having the initiative to to bring people together and start you know what we're working on today. So great debt of uh, thanks and gratitude to Clem. Uh, I love the conference because uh, 
uh, of what we're learning. I, I can't think of how many times when uh, different discussions in LOINC, uh, it comes up probably more in document ontology than in anything else. Uh, but it is to say, uh, we don't know. <laughs> And and actually the only and, and the only way we'd ever be able to answer it is to have people start using things. So I mean, just a fundamental, a very fundamental question. I mean, you think what you're trying to do with document naming is give something a usable, uh, succinct name that reflects in some way the content that you expect to find in that document. Now, that's such a squishy thing. I mean, a guy that I worked with. Uh, Larry Grandy used to say, yeah, that's like measuring a dough ball with a micrometer. I mean, <laughs> you're just, uh, but, you know, uh, we saw that just uh, people who are reporting on, on mapping, people who are reporting on social determinants of health, uh, all kinds of things, where they're trying to use things and in lots of cases, that's the only way that we're going to know whether we're doing it right is whether it's meeting the needs of the people who want to use it and whether that results ultimately in better patient care, uh, higher quality, lower costs, greater efficiency. Uh, we take better care of people because of that. And so I just love the, the fact that there are people here who are using it, trying to use it, trying to map it. Uh, that's just... Uh, there's no way to account for the value of that. It's it's priceless information in, try, in terms of trying to improve what we're doing. And I just encourage all of you to, to come at it from that perspective. We don't have, our, our agenda is to do what you need, you know, to provide what you need to take better care of patients. And so continue to communicate that, continue to uh, contribute your thoughts, Could bring up the challenges that you're having. Uh, that make it so that we can't, you, you can't do what you need to do uh, because that, that gives, gives us motivation and gives us direction in what we need to do. So, you know, please continue that. Uh, another quote, just kind of on the same thing, comes from another mentor of mine named Al Pryor. And he, he always said, you'll learn more about a subject uh, more about a system or software that you create by two days of live use than you will a year of designing and speculating about it. There's no substitute uh, in terms of just thinking about things that replaces real experience, real frontline use of what you're doing. So we just need to continue and, and uh, learn, learn from the experience. Uh, and and we love that. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to be useful. So let us know. Uh, I'm struck also by the international nature and the increasing international use of standards in general, but also of OINC. And boy, I love that. I just love that we have that uh, extra experience, different circumstances that makes us better, gives us a broader, more diverse community. Uh, I just love that. Uh, and I, I'm grateful for that in this conference. Uh, another concept that comes to mind, some of these come, this is just random stuff, but there are lots of things that we're working on that can't be solved by standards. It has to do with policies and funding and other things. And we need to remember that and focus on it. Uh, and another aspect of that is there are some of the problems that we're working on that can only be solved if the data is coded directly at the source. So instead of people picking whatever words they want and recording it in the database, and then after the fact, we come by and try and match it the closest thing or the appropriate thing, uh, that is always going to be uh, some approximation of real interoperability. To get to real interoperability, we, we probably need uh, clinicians 
to agree about what the important data is to collect and that what, what are the names of things, what are the coded representations, the definitions of things for that data that should be collected, which is going to come from SOMED and LOINC and UCOM and other things, so that we have a definition. And, and there are problems that we're working on that won't be solved until we get to that stage where we're agreeing what data needs to be collected and we're agreeing to the, the formal definition of those data elements. And those are assigned at the time that the data is generated, not as an artifact of mapping, which you know Keith Campbell could tell you about the challenges and foibles of trying to map after the fact, uh, because you're always that's always going to be a lossy map. Uh, so uh, that's just another thing. Uh, so the final thing I would say is just I. Uh, I love the people. I love working with you all. I love working with the people who are on the stage. I love uh, just an incredible community. And God bless you for having that genetic defect that makes this interesting to you. Uh, we need we need more of you. Go reproduce. Do something. Uh, at a minimum, think about you know. Uh, succession who who's who's going to take the you know who's going to take the role of of uh of jim campbell or me or some guys have actually announced they're going to retire i don't know if, they, if they'll actually do it but rob you know we this is a worthwhile activity love the people and uh let's find more of us uh, and thank you very much that's just my rambling thoughts uh I just hope you know how grateful I am for, for everyone, for the staff, for you, for the committee chairs. It's just a wonderful opportunity to work with you. And nothing really good happens in the world without people and relationships and creation of trust and respect and, uh, and, and a desire for diversity and, and sharing. So thank you. Recognize so that concludes the conference. Is George still there? George, do you have a video we showed on the first day? That can be sort of the close on me. You don't have it? Okay, don't worry about it. Bye, everyone. Thank you.